Yeah. Well, uh, press for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome um, to this evening's talk. Um, just before we get going, um, yeah. Well, uh, press for them. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, good okay. evening, everybody. Right. I had YouTube open in the background. That's on right. There we go. Hopefully, it'll go smoother from now on. Um, so, uh, a couple of quick announcements just to start off with. Uh, next week's talk is our annual Thomas More lecture. So, it's not on Thursday, it's actually on Tuesday next week. It's starting at seven o'clock. It'll be on our YouTube channel as normal. And um, we will have Professor David Jones. He's the uh, director of the Anscombe Center. And he's going to be talking about assisted suicide and Thomas More and John Donne. So it should be very interesting to come along. The mass uh, associated with that will be at 8.30. It'll be in the chaplaincy and you are welcome to come along in person if you're able to. Uh, there should be enough time between the lecture and the talk and the mass, sorry, to um, uh, walk over to the chaplaincy if you're able to join us in person. So please do come along for that. So um, this evening we have Abbot Hugh Allen. Uh, he's a past president of the society, so it's great to have him back. And he's the Apostolic Administrator of the Falkland Islands. So he's talking to us about spreading the gospel in such remote locations. So Abbot Hugh, whenever you're ready, um, take it away. Thank you, Vincent. And, and uh, sorry to interrupt your introduction there. I'm, I'm, I'm not really very good at Zoom, so I apologize as well. And um, I was saying to Vincent earlier that I have this very bad um, Zoom etiquette that I point at the, the, the person next to me. So if I'm pointing to the screen, it's because on my screen, Vincent's there. So uh, I, I apologize to begin with. I think we should begin with a prayer. So in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Hail Mary. Full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Star of the Sea, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So thank you very much, Vincent, for um, inviting me to, to speak to the uh, Newman Society. Uh, as, as a past president, it is, it's a real privilege to come back. Um, before coming, uh, I was trying to remember my term, and I, I can't remember much about it. It's lost in the, the, the history of, you know, the darkness of time. So, uh, but it's wonderful to come back, and, and it's wonderful to be with you, even uh, virtually by Zoom. As you heard uh, from Vincent, I, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the work that I look do for the church, and particularly in, in the South Atlantic. And um, one of the things that uh, I, I don't like is when you go to the, the, the barber, when you go to the hairdresser, remember when we used to be able to go to the hairdresser, you know, but those, those days, you know, please God will come back. But I, I never particularly like it when, when the, the, the person's talking to you, when you're getting a haircut. And, uh, you know, you've got to try and think of little chit chat and things. But I remember when I was first appointed to this role in 2016, I went to the barbers and, and uh, uh, he said, what do you do for a living? And I said, oh, you know, well, I'm the Apostolic Administrator of the Falkland Islands, and I'm the superior of the mission Suri Uris of St. Helena, Ascension Island, and Tristan de Kuna. And the great thing is it shut him up completely. He didn't know what to say. So we had a blissful silence after that. But that's my, my role, and that's the role that really I, I'm going to talk a little bit about this evening. Um, and that's really the gospel at the peripheries. The phrase splendid isolation, um, I'm sure you'll know, is one that was used uh, during the British Empire, that it was something that lived, uh, it was a Canadian prime minister, and it said that the, the British Empire lived in the state of splendid isolation. The islands that I look after, if you, if you like, still live in, in many ways in splendid isolation, and particularly, of course, in this last year during uh, the pandemic, that uh, their borders completely have closed, and so they've been completely isolated from the outside world. So I'm going to try and share my screen with you now. I've never done this before, so bear with me and hopefully it will work. Um, it says that the host disabled participant screen sharing, so that doesn't sound good. Um, so I'm not sure that's going to work. Should I try again? I you should be able to, to sort that out, apologies. No, uh, no, that's fine, that's fine. <laughs> Let's, um, I'll, I'll, if I... That should be sorted now. Okay, let's try that again. Oh, right, okay, wonderful, that's great. 
So hopefully you can see now the, the screen um, with the uh, prefecture title. So that's the title of the, the prefecture that I look after. It's the Apostolic Prefecture of the Falkland Islands and the Mission Suriuris of St. Helena, Tristan de Kuna and Ascension Island. Now, it is the largest uh, circumscription we're in, the, in the Catholic Church, if you like, it's the largest diocese in the Catholic Church, but it's actually two. Uh, there are two uh, areas. There's the prefecture of the Falkland Islands, and there is the mission sui juris of the other islands. So there are two separate uh, canonical identities, uh, one for the Falkland Islands and the other for the other islands. In the church, they come under the same person, but they are two distinct uh, areas. Um, so it's a dual role, but it covers uh, the islands in the South Atlantic. And I'll hopefully take you through the pictures as I go along. This is one of my first visits to uh, the Falkland Islands. And the lady I'm shaking hands with and the gentleman behind her are uh, Willie and Norma, who are parishioners in the Falkland Islands. And they're, they're something like sixth, seventh generation kelpers. So their they're families, their forebears, have always lived uh, you know, on the islands for many years and they're dedicated members of the parish and uh, they're every day for mass. And uh, so they get a good honorable mention at the beginning because they're really the, the pillars of the parish uh, that keep it going on the Falklands. So now you should be seeing hopefully a map of the, of the peripheries of the, of the area that, that I look after. So it goes really from the equator to the South Pole. Um, it's, uh, uh, as I say, it's one, we, we estimate it's about one sixth of the surface of the earth um, that comes under my, my pastoral care. Thanks, thankfully, 99.9% .9 of that is water. Um, but the, the islands that I primarily have care for, there are 748 uh, uh, different areas. There are 78 islands. There are four islands in particular that are inhabited all year round. And those are the ones that I have the privilege of looking after. At the top is Ascension Island, then St. Helena, Tristan de Kuna, and the Falkland Islands. Um, that's uh, quite a large area. And one of the great difficulties in this work is that you can't really get from one island to the other. You can occasionally get from St. Helena to Ascension Island. Not always possible, but sometimes. You can't get from St. Helena to Tristan de Kuna, and you can't get from the Falkland Islands to the other islands, except Ascension Island uh, sometimes. So traveling around is probably the greatest obstacle uh, in, in uh, spreading the gospel and living the gospel in the South Atlantic. But that, of course, brings with it its own unique challenges and possibilities. One of the greatest things you learn looking after such scattered and varied territory is to abandon yourselves to divine providence. Um, so often things don't go according to plan. Um, I think nearly every flight that I've got to the Falkland Islands has either been cancelled or delayed or something has happened or a bit's fallen off the plane or something's gone wrong. Um, something, you know, invariably goes wrong. And when you sail to Tristan de Kuna, the other islands, you're at the mercy of the shipping schedule of what they decide, of the weather. There's so many things that, that can adjust it. So in many ways, you take to heart um, that wonderful uh, book, Self-Abandonment to Divine Providence, you know, from the French Jesuit, Father de Cussard. And it's something that I've really learned to embrace uh, throughout my time in the last five years of looking after uh, these parishes, these islands, that really you have to just abandon yourself to God, that to know that, that God is in control, uh, this, is, this is God's work. And if it's going to happen, it will happen with his grace and with his love. If it doesn't happen, well, that's up to him as well. Um, you just have to really take to heart what it means to live in the sacrament of the present moment. Another phrase of Father de Cussard, that we have to live in that moment and live with God in, in that moment, wherever you find yourself. So getting to Tristan de Cunha, for example, can take anything up to nine, 10 days, depending on the weather, depending on the state of the ship as well. Um, that's a long time. Uh, to be on a fishing trawler and uh, it's not glamorous and there's not much to do. And so you really have an opportunity to be with God in unique moments, uh, to spend time with him and to know that he's there with you as you travel. So that's uh, when you look at the map, you get a sense then of, of the, 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 uh, 
the challenges and the, the, the vastness of the area that's looked after. The most famous uh, group of islands, of course, are the Falkland Islands. And the population, the civilian population is over, just over 2,000. There's a garrison of around 1,000 men and women who are stationed at Mount Pleasant, which is the military garrison on, on the islands. There are quite a lot of sheep on the islands. That's, you know, it's, uh, I, I was once asked by an American bishop, um, how many sheep in my flock? And I, I thought he was, you know, trying to be funny, but he actually did, he meant people. Um, but, I, you know, I could say, well, actually real sheep are in about half a million, you know, there's quite a lot of sheep. Um, and they do just roam around the island. Um, and that's the main work, if you like, on the Falkland Islands. The Catholic population varies quite dramatically according to who's there. And so it's, we estimate between two, 300 people. At the moment, we have a, a Benedictine priest who is the parish priest on, on the, the Falkland Islands. Uh, his name is Father Ambrose, and uh, he's an American Benedictine. And he's been there now for about a year and a half. Um, and he's, he's doing great work and doing wonderful things. And so my role really is to back up his work, to, to look after him and to help him in all that he does and to travel around the other islands. Mass attendance, well, it's a bit like the UK in a sense that it's, it's you know, um, it's about maybe 10, 12 percent of the Catholic population go to mass. The nationalities, again, it's a bit like the UK. It's, it's, uh, there are a few Kelpers, Islanders uh, who are uh, Catholics. The rest will be made up of Chileans or Filipinos who are working there. Um, and it's, it's wonderful to be there for them. You know, they're so far from home, um, but they still want to live the gospel and they've still got a great passion. Uh, for living the gospel of Jesus Christ, even when they're thousands of miles away from, from home and all that is familiar to them. Um, this is the, the church on uh, the Falkland Islands, St. Mary's Catholic Church. It's one of what, um, it was by, basically the British Empire had sort of Ikea churches. There were flat pack churches that were sort of shipped around uh, to different places. And you can still see some of them in Canada and Australia and even in India. And the, the, the church on the Falklands is a, is a prime example um, that it was put, all put together uh, in the UK and then was shipped out and then reassembled uh, on the islands. Um, it's made of wood. Most of the buildings on the Falklands are, are made of wood. There's very few building materials there. Um, so as you see, it's quite a, 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 a pretty, it's quite a pretty little church really. And it's uh, lovely to see a blue sky. Most people think it rains on the Falklands. Um, it does quite a lot, but also there's a lot of sunshine as well. And one thing, of course, that, you know, you can be very proud of is that even on the peripheries, even at the ends of the earth, you can find a wheelie bin. Um, so, you know, in the corner of the thing, you see the wheelie bin uh, that's come all the way from the UK. And so they even have those out in the Falklands. Just to give you a sense of the buildings that we have, there's the priest's house and uh, my house, the prefecture, if you like, which obviously um, uh, I don't live in at the moment because I'm based uh, most of the time in the UK. That means I can travel around the islands much easier than if I was, I was living on, on the Falklands. Um, so at the moment that's, that's uh, used by other people. Something that you'll find a lot on the Falkland Islands um, is this sign, you know, the, the minefield. And it's a constant reminder um, of the particular challenge of the Christian life on the Falkland Islands. Um, life there is marked, of course, by the invasion and the liberation of the islands um, uh, around 40 years ago. Um, that's a, a, a big feature of life there. And one of those are, are these signs uh, reminding you that there are minefields um, that are still haven't been cleared. Thanks be to God, just uh, at the end of last year, uh, a group of professionals from Zimbabwe managed to clear the last of the landmines. Um, and so now that's a, a, a wonderful thing that they managed to achieve. But it's also a reminder of the Christian call to reconciliation and to mercy and to forgiveness. And that that's not an easy process. Um, you know, when it comes to reconciliation, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And it's something we're all called to in our Christian life. But when you live on an island that's been invaded by another country um, and in living memory and with the scars still there on the landscape and in people's homes, then it's a challenge. Um, and I'd say that's one of the greatest challenges really to living the gospel message. Um, but it's also knowing that the gospel message is, is a work in progress. Um, and it's something that you can see there remarkably in, in the Islanders' lives 
I, they're incredibly generous and kind people, wonderful people, and you know, uh, are very welcoming to, to anyone who goes. Um, but you have to remember that the memory is there and you know, it's, it's something that still lives in their lives and it's a mark for them. So it's respecting what's happened, but also knowing as well that the challenge of, of following Jesus Christ is to move forward and to move forward in mercy and forgiveness with justice. You know, the two have to go hand in hand. Um, and so that's a work in progress. Um, and But it is for all of us in our Christian life. But it's a particular thing that, that you're very aware of on these beautiful islands. Something that you see as you as you leave, um, if you ever visit the Falkland Islands and as you leave, um, is something called Boot Hill. Now, this is just as you're driving out to uh, the garrison to, to catch the, the plane back to the UK. And it's a, a little field. And the tradition is that um, if you would like to go back to the Falklands, you leave one shoe. If you never want to see it again, you leave both shoes. Um, and actually, when you look at that picture, most of it's a single shoes. Uh, there's quite a couple of two shoes, but it's it's a place that uh, a lot of people love very much. Uh, it's also a place that some people, you know, found quite difficult to live in. It's very isolated. Um, you're cut off really quite dramatically from other places. It's not a place that everybody can live in. Um, and so there's this wonderful thing uh, as you go out, this reminder that, um, you know, our true homeland is heaven. Uh, and and uh, for now, we're passing through. Uh, and for everybody, it's sometimes difficult uh, where they want to be and, and what they want to be doing. The next island to just mention is Ascension Island. Um, this is a beautiful tropical uh, island uh, near the equator. And it's basically a volcanic rock uh, that has become a tropical paradise because of Darwin. Uh, when Darwin was sailing around the world, uh, he stopped off at Ascension and he planted uh, quite a lot of the cuttings and seeds that he had and collected. And so on this barren rock, he created in the middle a tropical paradise. Um, it's a testimony really to what uh, one person can do, the difference one person can make. Um, so you can see, uh, and the picture on the left, you see the the the, the, vest, the, 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 the vegetation and the lush you know, island uh, look there. On the right, you can see the Catholic church and it looks like a lunar landscape, you know, it's volcanic rock. Um, oddly, just opposite the church is a, uh, is a lava tube, um, just opposite the door to the church. And uh, it's a good preaching about heaven and hell, you know, one side heaven, the other side hell. So it's a, a good thing to, for, for using for that. Um, you can see here um, the presbytery. Uh, if you, you probably can't quite see in the picture, but it says the new Vatican Villa. Um, the priest's house was always called the Vatican Villa. Um, and uh, that sort of uh, was eaten up by termites. And so this is the new one. Uh, it's basically a shed, uh, but it's a very comfortable shed. So it's, you know, that's that's where you live. And the beach is the view that you have. So it swings and roundabouts. Um, the beach that you see uh, in the picture is, uh, it's where turtles come to lay their eggs. And it's, they come all the way from Brazil and they swim across to, to Ascension Island to lay their eggs and things. And the islanders uh, look after them and take care of them. and and uh, make sure that they don't get trapped. So it's a, it's a nice thing that they try and do. A big problem on Ascension Island is traffic. Um, now, something you find on, on, on Ascension Island, donkeys. It's the only place in the world that has wild donkeys wandering around the place, um, which is a nice reminder of the nativity um, in, in the middle of nowhere, but they are, they're, they're wonderful. Uh, well, they're noisy, but they're, they're, they're wonderful to come across. Um, this is a picture of my first visit uh, to Ascension Island uh, with the administrator and some of the United States Air Force. It's used predominantly by the United States Air Force. There is a British uh, RAF contingent there as well, but it's predominantly used by the United States. Interestingly, there is no right of abode on Ascension Island. Um, so uh, you're not allowed to be born there. You know, it, it's uh, if uh, you have to go to somewhere else to be born. So it's a uh, uh, the challenge there in living the gospel is there are you know, not roots. There are no roots there because people move around so much. Um, but perhaps it's a helpful reminder, you know, that, as I say, our true home is heaven. And even though, as you can see in the photograph, you know, bits of Ascension Island are heavenly and, and look like paradise, um, no one has a, a right to be there. Um, I'm not sure it's the same in our Christian journey. You know, Jesus Christ died for the forgiveness of sins and, and we trust in the redeeming blood of our Saviour. 
so we can have some hope of heaven. Um, so we've more more chance of being citizens of heaven than citizens of Ascension Island, but it's a, it's a unique and wonderful place and it's a great privilege to go there. St. Helena is the, the next island. And of course, St. Helena is famous for being at Napoleon's prison. Um, interestingly, this year is the bicentenary of Napoleon's death. And I meant to be there next month uh, or the month after um, for that, but I, with COVID and I, I won't be going, they've, they've got quite a strict quarantine um, and rightly so, it's an island, you know, so they need to look after themselves. Uh, very small population. If one person becomes ill, they all become ill. So they need to be very careful. Um, so I'm not sure when I'll, I'll next go there. This is the view as you arrive at St. Helena. Um, and uh, the first thing Napoleon said is, can anything live here? And uh, well, he did uh, for five years, um, but um, the, our probably his famous uh, occupant. But also the oldest uh, living mammal in the world, uh, uh, um, a tortoise, uh, is there, and he's 189 years old. So you can live on St. Helena, and lots of people do very happily. It has a population of around 6,000, and it's the second oldest uh, British overseas territory after Bermuda. The population on the island are known as saints um, because of St. Helena, so uh, the, you know, their, their nickname is saints, uh, which is a lovely, lovely thing to call people saints. And the Catholic population is difficult to really assess. But again, lots of people coming and going, and the island is predominantly Anglican. Um, there is an Anglican diocese of, of St. Helena, and, and, and they have the, the main area there. Um, Father David Musgrave is the parish priest. He's a Schoenstatt father, and he's been there since 2017. And that's the first resident priest since 2004. So he's been working quite hard to build up uh, the parish again, and I've been trying to support him to do that. Um, the challenge when you go there for the first time is this picture you see now. This is uh, uh, some steps called Jacob's Ladder. And there are 394 steps here. And they're all quite big steps, you know, and you're expected if it's your first time to walk up these steps. You know, it's um, it's one of those traditions that, that sometimes islands have, and you're expected to walk up. Um, and uh, by some miracle I did on, on my first visit, um, it took a long time. Um, but the lovely part of it is that as I was coming up two thirds up these steps, the Anglican bishop saw me uh, and, and um, he went to his house and he came and he met me at the top of the steps with a gin and tonic. And I, I think it was probably the most profound ecumenical encounter I've, I've ever had. It was a it was, a, it was a very important moment, but it was a great act of kindness. Um, the challenge here on, on St. Helena in, in living the Christian life, um, again, it's an island population. And, you know, they, they, economically, uh, they have a lot of challenges. Um, but also there are generations that have never been catechized, have never known anything about faith. And that's a real challenge on a small island. But Father David who is, is there is doing excellent work. Um, here you can see uh, the picture of the Sacred Heart. And this church was built for the soldiers who were guarding Napoleon. Um, so it's quite an old, uh, it's one of the oldest buildings on, on St. Helena. Again, it's an island of contrasts. It's an island that has great beauty, uh, but also quite a lot of barren landscape. So you can see in the photograph, hopefully now, you can see a hillside that looks wonderful and beautiful and lush. In the distance are, well, lots of barren rock. Um, you can see the rock that's sticking up in the distance. That's called Lot's Wife, uh, for obvious reasons. I hope, you know, biblical scholars among you know, uh, but it's, uh, it is an incredible place. Um, but that's, again, part of the challenge of, of spreading the gospel there, uh, the differences in, in the island and the geography of it, and the fact that it is so spread out. Here you can see Jamestown, um, which is the main town, to the right of Jamestown, you can see a, a line going up the hill. That's Jacob's Ladder. So that's the thing you, you walk up. Um, never again. Not it now. Don't have to do it again. Um, and then at the top, uh, you see another settlement. And the, the people live basically on the top. There are lots of valleys. Um, it's quite, you have to drive around. You can see some of the roads maybe on, on the photo there. And it's, a, again, a challenge to really trust God because the roads are quite tiny. Um, but of course, you've got road cars coming and going. And the, the, the custom is that if you're going up and you meet a car coming down, um, the car 
coming up has to reverse. Um, you know, so that's the, what you have to do. When I was first visited, I had a, a car. The, the parish, the, the parish had a car from the local garage, and uh, I was surprised to find it had no seat belts. Um, and I said to the man in the garage, you know, uh, a bit worried. There's no seat belts. Um, it was also tuned to country music, the radio, and it wouldn't turn off. But you know, I so I had Tammy Wynette for the whole time I was there. But that's a different story. Um, but there were no seat belts in this car, and I was a bit worried. So I said to the man. But right. And he said, well, legally, you don't have to wear them on, on St. Helena. And I said, well, I wasn't worried about the law. I was worried about safety. And he said, Father, have you seen our roads? And I said, yes. He said, well, if you go off that road, you're going to die. So you don't need a seatbelt one way or the other, you know. And again, it was it brought home that great need to trust God, you know, to really have faith. Um, and one of the one of the greetings you get on, on St. Helena um, is God is alive. Um, you know, you're walking on the street and someone will say to you, God is alive. And there's a great faith there still, mainly the older generation. Um, a lot of the younger, it's still a challenge to get them to know Jesus Christ. But, you know, there is a real faith there still. And uh, there's a great love and a great kindness. And there's a great concern for each other. Um, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing that you experience on islands is this great uh, community life uh, that they still have. Uh, the last of the islands to talk about is Tristan da Cunha. Um, and this is the most remote populated island um, in the world. Uh, and with then the most isolated Roman Catholic parish of St. Joseph's, the population of the island, I put there 263, but actually it's about 240 now. About a third of them are, are Catholics and a majority of them go to church on Sundays. Um, the parish is, is looked after by three catechists, um, Normally, I would travel there uh, at least once a year, uh, but I haven't been able to do that this last year. Um, and uh, traveling there is, isn't easy, but it's, it's, it's a rewarding experience. Um, there are two churches on the island. There is St. Joseph's Catholic Church um, and St. Mary's Anglican Church. And uh, they, a great thing on Tristan are stamps. Uh, people collect, you know, collect stamps and things. And... Uh, one of their main exports are stamps. So they, they like to put a lot of imagination into stamps. And this were, these were the Christmas stamps in 2013. I think the year when Pope Francis uh, was elected. And I, I love that they've got St. Joseph's next to St. Peter's and St. Mary's uh, next to uh, Canterbury. So it's, uh, it's a lovely uh, image for them to have really. This is the only settlement on the island, uh, uh, Edinburgh of the Seven Seas. They had to court, they had, it was always just Edinburgh, but they added seven seas because a lot of their posts kept going to Edinburgh and Scotland. So to, to clarify things, they added Edinburgh of the seven seas. Um, the Catholic Church is in the middle of, 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 the, of the settlement. Um, you can see, you know, the terrain, this is the only flat bit uh, on the island. And I, in the next picture, you'll see uh, why. Uh, so this is where uh, everybody lives. Most people have, um, then a, a bit of land in the potato patches, which is the other, uh, uh, not, not as flat, but a bit that they can farm, uh, which is further on. But this is basically it. So when you visit uh, Tristan da Cunha, this is, this is what you've got. You know, it's, it's, uh, you're going to an island in the middle of nowhere. And when you get there, th this, is, this is what you have to focus on. Um, this is the view that you get as you're coming to Tristan da Cunha. And as you can see, it's, it's a, a volcano. Um, and it's, an act, it's classified as an active volcano. Uh, it last erupted in 1961, and the islanders had to be evacuated, and they came to the UK. And they all wanted to go home. You know, they were given the opportunity to, to, to stay in Southampton, but they wanted to go back to Tristan, and they moved back uh, when it was safe to do so. You do get the odd wisp and, and the odd rumble that are a bit worrying, uh, but it's, uh, again, a great moment to trust God. You think, well... Here I am on this volcano. There you can see uh, Edinburgh, the seven seas at the bottom and the rest of the volcano. To the left of the photo, you can see the volcano that erupted in 61 the, the, that came up then. And that's actually where a bit of the town used to be, but obviously not now, um, they've moved this way. Um, so that's a part of where they are. This is the Catholic church, St. Joseph's. Um, now the story of, of, of Tristan de Cunha as, as a Catholic parish is remarkable because it was founded by a lady called um, Agnes. And Agnes was a housemaid from Malangar. And she moved to Tristan de Cunha to be a maid 
for the administrator. And when she arrived, she was horrified to find that there was no Catholic church, no Catholic priest, and really no Catholic population. She was it, basically. And they said to her, well, you'll just have to come to the Anglican church. And Agnes said, no, I, I want to worship God as a Catholic, and I, I've always been a Catholic, and I wish to live as a Catholic. And she was treated pretty roughly with this. You know, she was, um, she was actually, you know, she was starved of rations, and they were trying to force her uh, to go to the um, Anglican church. But in the end, her perseverance won through and her kindness. That was one of the things that changed people's mind was her kindness and generosity. And so she was allowed to set up a little chapel in her, in her sitting room. And there she would read the Missal every Sunday. And she married an Islander and uh, brought up her family as Catholic. She had lots of children and uh, they were brought up as Catholic, catechized by their mum. And she basically established this Catholic community in the middle of this island and they didn't see a Catholic priest so that was around uh, the early 1900s. The first Catholic priest visited in 1932 and he was amazed to find this family, uh, you know, Granny Aggie as she was known by then and Granny Aggie had uh, established this community with her family and uh, the priest was Father Barry and he said that he had never met such well catechized and well-prepared children in his life. So he heard their first confessions and he gave them communion. They'd never had Holy Communion. They'd never been to a mass. And yet there was this, this, this Catholic parish. It's remarkable, uh, really, uh, that here on, on the periphery, um, they, they were uh, brought up in their faith. And the reason the faith is still going on the island is because of the descendants of, of Granny Aggie, but also because that they still catechize each other. They still teach each other. I try and help. Uh, by the marvels of Skype and Zoom and things, and when I can visit, um, but they still uh, have a great love for the faith and a great respect for the faith, and it's the families that teach it and share it and catechize each other, and it's fantastic, and it's a wonderful example for the rest of us. The last thing to tell you about uh, St. Joseph's, um, I'm very aware well, I'm talking too much, so I shall try and and, and, and uh, move on quickly, but uh, St. Joseph's, uh, this isn't the original chapel, so there was Granny Aggie's sitting room, and then they grew out of that, and they had a smaller uh, chapel on this site. Um, and, you know, they, they were a bit worried, uh, you know, the, about the, the practicing of the faith in the island. And uh, like a lot of places, some, you know, some of the children weren't so keen to go to church things. So they decided to do a novena to St. Joseph and uh, to say to St. Joseph to help them to bring people together again to, to the church. And they thought, well, when our prayers are answered, when St. Joseph intercedes for us and when good, the good Lord hears our prayer, we're going to need a bigger church. So they built St. Joseph's, the bigger church, around the shell of the original chapel in the hope, in the expectation that their prayers would be heard. And they were. And that little chapel, that church is full every Sunday. Um, so it's a great testimony to faith. Um, you know, a lot of the in the church now, particularly after the year we've had, you can hear people say about, you know, we're going to have to close this. We're going to have to empty that. We can't give in to that. We have to keep going forward and trust God and rely upon his grace. And yes, of course, financially, we have to think sensibly about things. But we also have to have faith and trust in God and that he's in control. Uh, and that, you know, if we pray uh, and, you know, live our faith, that's the answer. That's what God expects us to do. This then is my mode of transport. Um, to So on the right is the, the, the boat that goes to St. Helena. Uh, as you can see, it's quite comfortable. You know, quite, quite nice, really. You can just see a little black dot, uh, and that's me uh, enjoying the sunshine. The boat on the left is the fishing trawler that I take to get to Tristan de Kuna. And this is the good ship Edinburgh. And uh, I remember vividly the very first time I, I saw this ship in harbour, and it was a Cape Town, and uh, being taken along, you're going past these great, vast, huge ships, and then suddenly coming to this rusty, uh, dirty uh, fishing trawler and um, I did have a 10 minute I'll never forget it was probably the most intense moments of prayer in my life where I, I really had to say to the Lord I'm, I'm not sure I can do this you know it's uh, it's very small uh, and I'm very big and I'm not sure this is going to work out um, so I really had to pray very hard and uh, in the end you know you just have to get on with it you know and, and uh, trust trust the Lord will, 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 will sort it out I think you know you, you might have picked up by now that I think the greatest lesson I've learned in the five years of, of looking after uh, 
uh, these islands is trust. Um, I really have to trust God um, that he's in control and, and, and let him look after things. It is an extraordinary ship to travel on. You know, it's um, in this, you know, most waves do that. Uh, in the South Atlantic, they do that. Um, so for the first two or three days out of Cape Town, it's like being in a tumble dryer. You know, you're, you're thrown all over the place. And uh, the bunk bed is tiny. It's like sleeping in a coffin. Um, not that I've stepped in a coffin, but I imagine, you know, one day I will, uh, but I imagine it'd be similar. Um, and it's, it's yeah, it's it's pretty um, pretty extraordinary. But the the, the fishermen uh, that work on the, uh, they, they love seeing a priest. They love having someone to talk to. It's wonderful uh, to be able to speak and, and, and trust them, you know, and, and you know, it's 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 great to, to to be able to be on it. It is an extraordinary journey, and it's not for you have to really <laughs> you have to really be uh, keen to get to Tristan da Cunha uh, to go on, on on that ship. But um, there are there's another ship that goes as well. There's also a South African research vessel that goes once a year, um, and that's uh, really that's quite nice to go on. But I've only been on that once. I've been on the Edinburgh lots of times. Um, I've been on the other only once. Again, my, my first trip on the Edinburgh, uh, we were delayed leaving the harbour. And when I woke up in the morning and looked out my porthole, the Queen Mary was parked next to us, well, parked from the moor next to us. And I really did think, you know, God, you, you're mocking me now, you know, Lord, there's a real mocking going on. But anyway, but, you know, it doesn't matter where we are, it matters that we're with the Lord. And then this last one is um, back to the Falkland Islands again. And... Uh, these are the sea lions that you can see. Lots of people think about penguins uh, in the South Atlantic. There are lots of uh, uh, wonderful wildlife that you can see. And the great thing is, of course, that they're, you know, it's, uh, you can just walk around. You have to be a bit careful because they are very big. Um, so, you know, just have to, mind you, they just thought I was one of them, really. But I mean, it, you, know, you have to be careful as you're going around. But it's uh, a great privilege to be able to wander around uh, uh, and to see some beautiful places on, on the islands. I'm going to minimize that now. Um, I'm not sure that's worked. Um, so that's just to give you a visual aid to the challenge of the life of the island. Um, it's incredible that on all these islands, um, there is a chapel. And in every single one of them, there is a little red light shining. And it's a reminder that Jesus Christ is there in the tabernacle, that there at the ends of the earth, uh, far away from so many things, there's Jesus Christ, and he makes his home, and he's there. And it's a beautiful thing that uh, I love to remember about the islands, that even when I'm not there, or the priests who look after them can't be there, the Lord Jesus Christ is there. And, and it's a wonderful thing uh, that at the peripheries, you know, he's there, and it's, it's wonderful. It is uh, a, a challenge to live, not just to live the faith on these islands, and the people who are there are remarkable. And I encountered great kindness and, and great courage and some wonderful examples of Christian virtue. Um, but there is, there's also the other side as well. There's the challenge of uh, spreading the, the, the news of the, of the gospel to a new generation, to people who you know, haven't darkened the door of a church for many years. So there's still the same challenges perhaps that we have um, in the... Um, in the UK and in, in Western Europe. The motto of Tristan da Cunha uh, for the whole island is our faith is our strength. And I think that's a great example that all the islands um, can give us. Um, and it is, I think, again, living in the sacrament of the present moment, taking to heart the need to abandon ourselves to divine providence and to slow down. You know, so often our, our life, uh, uh, well, apart from the last year, uh, has, has lived in the fast lane. Um, I, somebody did ask me, you know, did I, have I found it easy to cope with the pandemic because I'm used to a, a slower pace of life in the South Atlantic? Well, you know, this is forced on us this time. So it's a very different, uh, a, a different experience. Um, but it is still important to take time. And, you know, one of the great things on, on the islands is to enjoy uh, living uh, and, and, and that it isn't something that's to be wasted. That every single moment is is a moment of grace, and as you know, Fulton Sheen reminds us, you know, life is worth living. Um, and on the islands, they certainly believe that. So that's a little dip into the life of the church in the South Atlantic. It's uh, you know, I know the islanders would be very appreciative of your prayers, um, but also maybe we can learn a little bit uh, about living our faith by knowing that our faith is our strength and trusting God. 
uh, and know that with him all will be well. So it's a great privilege to be uh, the apostolic administrator or the prefecture of the Falkland Islands and the superior of the mission Suryuris. And uh, even if it shuts up Barbers, uh, it still stuns me uh, that I'm allowed to do this. And it's a great gift. In October, I'll finish my five year term. I talked to, I don't know what will happen then and, and maybe I'll carry on, I don't know, but it's uh, it's been a, an incredible privilege and I've experienced the grace of God in so many wonderful ways. And that's just a little bit for you to take home and to think about, about the gospel of Jesus Christ in splendid isolation. Bless you. All right, great. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Abba Hugh. Uh, so now we'll just move to some questions. If anyone has any questions, then just chuck them in the uh, chat on the YouTube stream and then I can uh, pass them on. So just to kick things off, perhaps, uh, you mentioned the uh, Falklands War briefly. I was wondering how that um, affects the church directly on the islands. Does it have a particular impact if, say, um, sort of uh the, you were saying the catholic population is predominantly south american so does that have any particular are there strong feelings sort of about the war within the church does that cause any difficulties for spreading the gospel there uh, thank you vincent i'd say um individually islanders are, are, are as i said very welcoming and very open to anyone who comes along um they are, you know, fiercely defensive of, of their home, and it is their home. You know, that's, I mean, for all of us, our true home is heaven, we know, but, but it's where they live here and now, and they're very protective of that, and we have to respect that. But we also have to remember that we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and um, it's a work in progress, if you like, uh, in uh, opening up uh, to those from Argentina who might want to visit. Two years ago, I had the incredible privilege of being there at the ceremony to uh, name some of the soldiers uh, from the Argentine forces who were buried in the cemetery. They, they hadn't been able to name them and the Red Cross had done amazing, incredible work in um, trace tracking and, and you know, establishing the graves and who they were. And uh, to mark this, uh, relatives of those who were buried there uh, came um, and there was a bishop from Buenos Aires who was there and I was there and, and it was an incredible moment. Um, it was a very powerful moment. When I, 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 you know, you know, I always felt I was intruding to be there, but it was a great privilege to be there because after the uh, ceremony, we we blessed the graves together, and so the Argentine bishop and I together went around and, and we blessed the graves. And there was one I remember quite powerfully. There's a, 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 a an Argentine mother at the grave of her son, and she said to me, "Well, Father, you know, um, through a translator, I don't expect, uh, you know, that uh, now I know where my son is." Um, I can die. Uh, and that's what she was waiting for. She didn't, you know, she didn't want to go home to heaven without knowing where he was here before she saw him again there. Uh, and uh, that was her great hope. So there are moments like that, but it is, it's a, a, a work in progress. And, and as I say, you know, um, it, our Christian life is a journey and, and uh, the, the islands are very much are still on that journey. Um, but it's uh, getting that, that balance right. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, just bringing in some questions from YouTube. So we've got Matteo asking, um, thank you for, for such a wonderful and insightful talk. Um, a recurring theme of Pope Francis' pontificate has been an, an invitation to journey to the periphery. How does this resonate with you? Well, I live it really. <laughs> That's a bit boastful, isn't it? <laughs> no, I don't mean it like that. But I, I hopefully I'm, I'm putting that into practice. And um, but uh, it's knowing as well that when you get to the peripheries, the gospel is there. You know, it isn't just about taking it there. It's knowing that it's lived there, uh, and that we can learn from how the gospel is lived out in those moments. Um, I was fortunate. This is going to sound, you know, I'm, this is a uh, sounds a bit big, but I'm meeting holy meeting the Holy Father in 2018. We had the ad limina visit, and um, uh, you know, we all got to meet him and, and talk with him. And the one thing he said to me was, you know, he was talking about the importance of bishops visiting their parishes and, uh, you know, they need to go and, and be with people. And it's wonderful to hear. And he pointed at me and he said, but of course, for you, Hugh, uh, that's going to be a challenge because you'll have to you'll have to row uh, around the, you know, and he did that. You know, he was, he was doing that. It was it was a lovely moment. Um, but he, you know, it was great to see how he, he obviously knew who people were uh, and 
Pope Francis is someone who gets a great energy from people. You know, that you sometimes there's two types of people really. Um, those who are exhausted by being with people and, and those who are energized by being with people. And you can see that the Holy Father is very much someone who loves being with people. And I think that comes across uh, in his desire for us to, to, to take the gospel everywhere and, and to not exclude anybody uh, from the good news um, and to take that to heart. Great. Um, so then just a, a little comment from uh, chap called Matthew Morris, who's um, he just says Father Father David Musgrave was his old parish priest who and the one who baptized him and just good to hear he's doing well. Um, Amit is asking, uh, what lessons do you think your experiences might hold for those those of us back home in England, uh, England and Wales? Um, and uh, what in, in a way? Uh, in a way, you might say we find ourselves ever more on the periphery. Yes, I think the greatest lesson is don't don't never take your faith or the sacraments for granted. You know, uh, this year, um, you know, with with the lockdown and things, you know, churches closed and things, and people were unable to go to the mass, were unable to go to the sacraments. You know, the people that I look after and take care of, you know, that's an experience they have a lot of the time. You know. Uh, uh, Tristan de Kuna, they see a priest once a year if they're lucky, and and uh, so they only get you know uh, the mass and the sacraments when he's there. The blessed sacraments still there in the tabernacle, and they go to the Lord, but you know the other sacraments they they can't really uh, have, have ready access to. And I think for us then, it's never to take these things for granted that you know that the Lord has given us such an amazing and, and incredible faith, such wonderful gifts in the sacraments, and um, we should never take them for granted. And never get you know fussy as well when we think well hold on a minute why is my priest not doing this or why is not doing that you know I, it's it's um i heard a wonderful expression about this from a polish priest and it was the you know for us as christians uh we're not about is the glass half full or is the glass half empty as christians we're just grateful to have a glass and and you know <laughs> I, I think that's um important for us that we have our faith and we have the sacraments and never take them for granted and we are, you know, the interesting thing as well, on Tristan de Kuna and, and uh, the, the, the other the small islands, um, the faith is still very much at the heart of, of community life. You know, particularly on Tristan, you know, the whole island life centres around St Mary's, St Joseph's. Um, you know, it's, it's very much still there at the heart of things. In the UK and Europe, we're on the peripheries in society. Um, uh, so, but that, that the challenge for us then is, is that we have to keep bringing Christ back into the debate and, and not be pushed out. Uh, you know, the, there's a temptation maybe in, in the world we live in that, that doesn't want to hear uh, the voice of the Catholic faith or, or, or the voice of truth and the absolute truth of Jesus Christ. And we have to be careful not to uh, keep going back, you know, to, to let, you know, keep pushing, you know, um, don't keep, so I, I think that'll be the big lesson maybe I'd say is, you know, we've got to keep pushing, you know, we, we are on the peripheries, um, but we don't want to fall off, you know, we, we, we've got to um, keep bringing Christ back, keep bringing him, you know, keeping bringing the Lord back into what we're doing. Great, well, thank you. Um, that links quite neatly to the next question. Uh, Pius is asking, you mentioned the importance of parents uh, catechizing children on the peripheries. And what can this radical vocation to parenthood teach us as the church in the West enters the peripheries as secularism becomes more dominant in what was once the centre of Christendom? Gosh, that's a very good question. That's not from Father Pius in my community, is it? I mean, that, you know, that, that sounds like it's from him, but I, <laughs> no, I hope it's not. Um, but um, I think it's the fundamental role that we have to remember that families have, you know, in the baptism. The priest says to uh, the father in the blessing, you will be the first teacher of this child in the ways of faith. Now, that's that's so important. You know, that that's at the heart of, of what it means to live in a Christian family. And, you know, we as priests, as a church, we have a responsibility to help you and to support you. Um, but that's we're there to help, you know, and the primary uh, role is in, in the family. And not losing sense of what it means to be a mother, what it means to be a father, you know, those distinct roles and that, that um, children, you know, need that. And um, uh, like Granny Aggie, if you like, on Tristan de Kuna, you know, the, they, they only had the faith because of this one woman and she was stubborn and she was determined 
and and that's what kept the faith going and i think sometimes maybe um this being a bit stubborn uh, uh always in charity always always in love and kindness but but uh, having that firmness in the faith and because it's it's the truth and and i think that's maybe something in our families that we need to reinvigorate and remember that this isn't a good idea this is the truth this is the truth sent to us from above as there's the hymn said you know this is the truth we're given and we need to live and and to treat it like that not to treat it as something abstract or um, you know, it's one of my favorite lines of Pope Benedict um, that, you know, that we, we have to encounter the person of Jesus Christ because a person uh, needs a mother and, you know, an, an abstract idea doesn't need a mother. Um, you know, so, you know, our faith is, is given to us um, uh, to, to be lived. And I think that's the, the challenge that families have. And it's, it's hard. It's really difficult. And um, I think maybe we priests, you know, need to step up a little bit more to, to help families with that and always you know bother your priest about it sometimes don't you know i mean he's got a lot going on i'm sure your parish priest thinks but you know if you need help then then hopefully your parish priest will be more than happy to help i mean it's it's a delight to be able to talk about the faith and I'm, I'm sure your parish priest will be delighted to help in that way i'm not sure i've answered the question but hopefully i have a little bit great thank you um so then uh, Becca is asking, uh, thank you for the lovely tour of the South Atlantic. You gave lots of examples of when trusting in God was a crucial part of your ministry. How can we learn uh, to better trust God in our lives here? It's a very good question. And I, I, it's, <laughs> it's really though at the heart of, of what it means to, to, to follow Jesus Christ um, is to trust him. Um, and uh, a relationship only works if there's trust. Um, but it's at the heart, really, of, of when we say the Our Father. You know, I think one of the most important lines in the Our Father is to say, Thy will be done. Not my will, not uh, the desire of other people, but, but, but God's will. And to ask for his grace to accept that and to live that, to let his will be done. Um, it's not easy. You know, that's the great, you know, it, um, it's one of the things about uh, trust, uh, particularly trust in the Lord, that, um, you know, uh, it's hard, you know, and we can see that in the Gospels that, uh, you know, the apostles found it almost impossible to do. You know, when when our Lord calls to Peter across the water and to come to him and, and Peter starts to sink and our Lord says, why did you doubt a man of little faith and tells him off? Well, I always feel sorry for Peter in that because that would be me. You know, I'd, I'd have probably drowned, you know, I mean, you know, the, you know, trusting him with that. But then you come back to, again, Peter. And it's it's the great thing for our faith today. Um, at the end of John chapter six. Uh, where our Lord has been teaching us about the awesome wonder and the beauty of the Eucharist uh, and his real presence in, in, in the Blessed Sacrament. People find it hard to accept this teaching and people leave him. And he turns to the apostles and says, are you going to go too? And Peter says, Lord, who can we go to? You have the words of eternal life. And I think that's at the heart of trusting God to, to say, well, who else can I go to? Who else am I? You know, trust God. Oh, that helps a little bit. Oh, great. So uh, Alex is asking, um, how is your, um, you're going to have to, have to forgive me, I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it, right? Uh, how is your vocation as a Premonstratian canon, Norbertine canon anyway, uh, and abbot uh, in the spirit of St. Norbert influence your pastoral care of the island? So the name is Premonstratensian, which is a, it's a very difficult one to get right. The order has many different titles. In England, we tend to say Norbertine because it's an easier word to say. Um, but we're canons regular of Premontre, and so Premonstratensian uh, is... is um, uh, the motto of our order is to be ready for any good work. And um, <laughs> if you told me the good work that I had to be ready for was this when I made my vows, uh, I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure. You know. <laughs> I'm not sure how that would have worked out, um, but that's at the heart of what it means to to be docile to the will of God and in vows, you know, abandon yourself then to, to what happens, um, but to be ready then for any good work that comes. At the heart of our life, um, as an order, we're both monastic and active, and so we're both contemplative and, and apostolic, and I think that's been the greatest thing that maybe has helped me in this work, is that balance in, in prayer and work, uh, and I've been able to take that with me. Uh, in going to the islands, that that's something that's helped, uh, certainly helped me, hopefully it's helped the islanders, uh, you know, but uh, but it's, it's helped me in the work I do, is that balance between uh, prayer, contemplation, and, and the apostles in the work, 
and that the two go hand in hand. Um, and, and they're, you know, at the heart of, of, of what we do. Fundamentally, every Christian is called to that. Uh, as an order, that's just at the, at the heart of, of our life. So I'd say that's probably the way that, that the life as a normal team has helped me. Um, I, it's, it's difficult, though, being away from the office. You know, we sing the office together. And I think um, the two things I miss most when I'm away are the singing of the choral office and my conference. You know, I, I'm I love the community I live in and I'm blessed to, to live in it and uh, I do miss them. Don't tell them I said that because they'll get big heads. But I do do love them and they're wonderful. So I miss them. But I miss, you know, the seeing of, of the, the office. That's something. But, you know, it's there when I come home. So it's uh, great to be able to come home to them. Great. Well, I think we've just got time for one more. So uh, Michael is asking, do you think that uh, because the inhabitants of these islands live in such isolation, they have a greater receptivity to the idea of faith, perhaps owing to a heightened awareness of their own mortality? Many seem to live in the shadow of a volcano and uh, their location on the edge of the known world. Yes, that's exactly it. I mean, I remember my first visit to Tristan de Kuna, you know, one of the islanders said, well, you can't be an atheist and live on a volcano. You know, you know, it, 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 you've got to you, you've got to trust the Lord. But also when you're uh, their life, um, again, particularly on St. Helena and well, on the Falklands and on, on Tristan as well. And, the islands, uh, you know, it's so connected with the rhythm of nature and the rhythm of life that, that we've lost, you know. So they're still, you know, it's it's dark. Well, you go to bed. The sun comes up, you get up, you go fishing, you work. Um, you know, it's it's still the rhythm of things is still there. And I think it, it's actually a good way of, of the, the, the the way that God has created the world to be, that we're uh, more uh, open to him, if we like, if we're living the, the cycle of life that he's created. I hope that makes sense. I'm not sure that I sound a bit odd there, but I don't mean sound, but that it's, it's you that, that, you know, we've... Um, <laughs> You know, we've divorced ourselves really so much from from the reality of God, you know, and the reality of what it means to be alive, uh, that sometimes we lose that immediate sense of God. So on the islands, you know, great thing is that they, they, their faith in God is very real and very immediate and is a great part of their life and a natural part of their life. Um, and I think that's maybe something that we're, we're missing and, and we, we, you know, it'd be lovely to rediscover them. I can't, you know, I don't know how, um, but, it, it, you know, that's above my pay grade. No, but, you know, we can, we can uh, keep praying for that. But it's, um, it's knowing that, you know, God created all things and we are part of that creation. And that's why things are important. Um, you know, that it's, it's uh, the, world, <laughs> the, the world is passing away. And we know no one would head, only hope to God. Um, but whilst we're here, we have a duty and responsibility to, 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 look after it, take care of it. And the islanders are, you know, that's something they're very aware of as well. So I think I've gone off on a tangent there, but I, I hope that sort of uh, makes a little bit of sense. Um, well, great, thank you. That's a, a good note to uh, to draw things to a close on. So thank you. Thank you very much for coming. That was a, a fantastic talk. And um, just to remind everyone, don't forget next week, we're on a Tuesday, not on Thursday, and it's at seven o'clock uh, on our YouTube channel, and then followed by mass at 8.30 in the chaplaincy come along in person if you are able to. And so now we'll go to the chapel for Adoration, Benediction and Compton.
Christ have mercy. Lord have mercy. our ghostly foe, that spot of sin we may not know. O Father, that we ask be done, through Jesus Christ, thine only Son, who with the Holy Ghost and thee doth live and reign eternally. He has put into my heart a marvelous love for the faithful ones who dwell in his land. 
Those who choose other gods increase their sorrows. Never will I offer their offerings of blood. Never will I take their name upon my lips. I will bless the Lord who gives me counsel, who even at night directs my heart. I keep the Lord ever in my sight. Since he is at my right hand, I shall stand firm. You will show me the path of life, the fullness of joy in your presence, at your right hand, happiness forever. As it was in the beginning, is now in the shadow, world without end. Amen. It's your rest and safety. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared for all nations, light to enlighten Gentiles, and give glory to Israel and your people. As it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be, the world without end. Amen. So while we are awake, protect us while we sleep that we may keep watch with Christ and rest with him in peace. Amen. Ave Regina Cerulo, Ave Domina Salve Radix, Salve Porta, Ex Quam Mundo Lux Est Orta, Gaudet Sub tuum presidium confugimus, 
Sancta Dei Genitrix, Nostra Steprecatiores, Led us be Chias in necessitatibus, Sed a periculis cunctis, Libera nos semper, Virgo Gloriosa, Et Benedicta. That we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ.